Leaves drop from the trees, vibrant colors fading to a dull, decrepit brown. Shadows lengthen, daylight dwindles. Down every street, candles alight and hollowed out gourds scarred with twisted visages of horror and delight. In short, it's Halloween! Or it was a week ago, but spooky season isn't quite over yet. Terrifying television and gruesome video games are more popular than ever, but for all the slasher flicks and unsettling board games, we've yet to see the ideas of fear and horror faithfully adapted into a successful trading card game. Can we develop this ill-explored design space and craft a truly terrifying TCG? Let's talk about it today on Draw 5 Move 5. Hey everyone, and welcome to the table. My name is Gabe, and this is Draw 5 Move 5, a show where we draw connections between the mechanics behind our favorite games. Before we start, I want to give a quick thank you to everyone who subscribed, liked, commented, and of course, dingling that notification bell in the past few months. More on this later, but it means a lot to me, and the channel wouldn't be here without your support. The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. That quote is from H.P. Lovecraft, writer of The Call of Cthulhu and many other famous tales of cosmic horror in his 1927 essay, Supernatural Horror in Literature. On the surface, this makes trading card games a great medium for crafting a frightful experience. Variance and chance creating unknown outcomes are crucial to their design. In fact, Lovecraft's own Mythos was adapted into two trading card games, the aptly named Mythos CCG in the mid-90s and Call of Cthulhu the card game in the mid-2000s. These games are now defunct, which is surprising considering how popular the Mythos is. Both games had the subject matter boiled into their mechanics, the theming was right, but something in their execution failed to deliver the fear, the existential dread and horror that lie at the dark heart of every Lovecraft story. Mark Rosewater, head designer for Magic the Gathering, spoke on creating emotional player experiences at 2016's Game Design Conference in reference to Innistrad, a horror-themed set developed in 2011. That when you look at the horror genre, that it's about scaring the audience. It's about creating a sense of terror, a suspense, of dread. So when I built the set, I actually built mechanics with that in mind. So lesson number six, understand what emotion your game is trying to evoke. Like, once again, the theme of today is you're... Humans are emotional creatures. You are trying to get a response out of them. Think about what emotion you're trying to get, and then make sure your game is moving in that direction, that all your components are trying to get the emotional response you're trying to get from your audience. Somewhere along the way, the design of these Lovecraftian card games lost sight of their emotional core. In practice, the games were more about complex deck building and resource management with a Cthulhu paint job than creating a feeling of dread and terror. <laughs> I think we can do better. This Halloween, we'll dive deep into a dark and fright-filled design tank to make our own hypothetical TCG, one that effectively weaves terror into its mechanics. We'll start by analyzing fear itself, breaking it into various types that we can prey on and elicit in our players. Next, we'll discuss techniques used in a variety of gaming media to evoke fear, and a few pitfalls we'll avoid from Lovecraftian card games. Last, we'll do a brief design session discussing how to implement these techniques within the mechanics of our TCG, sewing the emotion we want players to feel into the heart of our creation. With that laid out, let's crack open the arcane tomes of All Hallows' Eve and begin, shall we? In order for us to craft a truly terrifying card game, we have to start with Mark's advice and understand the emotion we're trying to elicit. Fear, according to Merriam-Webster, is an unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. It's a survival instinct that dumps a chemical cocktail of hormones into our bloodstream as a part of our fight-or-flight response. In controlled environments where we know the danger isn't real, like movies, haunted houses, and amusement park rides, the response is similar to getting a rush of dopamine, one of the hormones that causes happiness. As such, many people actually enjoy being afraid. That's our target audience. Fears can be broken down into several kinds. There are obvious fears, a fear of something where the source is known and understood. 
a gun, a snake, or a house on fire are obvious fears. They're logical. The gun can shoot you, which would kill you, and you would be dead. But as Lovecraft said, our oldest fear is fear of the unknown. A fear where we don't know or understand the source. Hearing rustling in the bushes, seeing eyes in the darkness, and so on. It could be anything, so its threat to us is unclear. The related creepy fear is a sense of unease which comes from things that are not quite right, where we know but only partly understand the source. A face with eyes too large or a smile too wide, something you know but is off enough that it's unclear if it's dangerous. And finally, horrific fear, the kind Lovecraft uses near the end of his stories in an evolution of creepy fear. This is the fear of the wrong, where it's on full display that something is unnatural. We know the source, but its familiarity is bent and twisted so far out of shape that our expectations are subverted and we no longer understand its danger. Cthulhu, for all it is, is just an octopus. An octopus on a humanish body with bat-like wings larger than the Empire State Building that will do something to us? We know it's dangerous, but we don't know how, because we no longer understand it or know it in its compound, unnatural form. When designing individual creatures, characters, or locations, we could largely stick to one of these fears, but because we're crafting a card game with tons of individual cards, we'll need a mix of understandable and incomprehensible sources to make cohesive settings and give players something to latch on to. For tools and techniques, video games are a great starting point to implement these different fears and evoke responses in the player. There are several key techniques horror games use, although one needs to be thrown out immediately for our purposes. Despite my love for sound design, it isn't something we can use in a physical card game without requiring players to wear headphones, something that increases the barrier to entry and actively discourages interactivity. Are you really going to chat with your opponent when there are scary noises in your ears? Using jump scares is more questionable. The fear of a jump scare comes from the anticipation of something happening, followed by the shock of the threat revealing itself suddenly. In a competitive TCG, players build their own decks and learn their opponents, so anticipation and surprise are much harder to build. That said, I have a solution to implement this, but I'll keep it a surprise for now. We're building anticipation, remember? As for techniques we can definitely implement, the first is pretty simple, aesthetics. Horror video games design the creatures, locations, and lighting to actively disturb or scare the player, drawing on our fears of the creepy and the horrific to unsettle and frighten us. In Amnesia the Dark Descent, for example, the creatures are human enough to be familiar, but then twisted out of shape in how they look, move, and sound, so they are no longer what we expect. That's horrific fear in action. The environment and lighting also contribute playing off our fears of the dark and literally causing the game to play tricks on us through hallucinations. In Five Nights at Freddy's, meanwhile, we see aesthetics preying on a fear of animatronics, which are humanoid and animalistic enough to be familiar, but not so much to be correct. Their movement, actions, and sounds push them further into horrific fear. Freddy's lighting and visuals also hook into another technique horror games use, limiting information. The camera systems, distracting sounds, and inability to leave the room make it difficult to know what's going on, utilizing fear of the unknown. By limiting the player's visual and auditory inputs, they start to fill in the gaps on their own, imagining worst-case scenarios and impairing their own actions. Amnesia does this as well with its lighting system, minimizing what the player can see and muddying what information they have to the point that they might not be able to trust it at all. Finally, these games also limit player action so that they feel helpless, stressed, and afraid. It's important to note that although they feel this way, the players still have options. What makes playing a horror game different from a horrifying story is that the game has a win condition, and we have to sacrifice some of what makes it scary in order to give the player enough agency to enjoy themselves and interact. Imagine having a nightmare. You're being hunted by an axe-wielding maniac. Your body feels so slow, so heavy. Everything is numb, it's hard to move, hard to think. As his laughter grows closer, each step you take seems smaller, until finally you 
going nowhere at all. At last, Body barely responded. He trip on a rock and topple like a dying oak. Above you stands the cackling maniac who plunges down his axe to split you in twain. Is that scary? Sure, I mean, I was scared. Or was it fun? Well, no, not really. There was nothing you could do. Losing was the only option. Nightmares aren't games. They aren't interactive, they railroad you. Interaction promotes immersion and gets players invested, which makes the game fun. In building our mechanics, as well as analyzing these games, we'll keep this in mind. The limitations placed on the player are also established from the beginning. We give them the rules so they know how to play. In Amnesia and Freddy's, for example, the players can't really fight back and have very limited options for protection, made clear from the start. In Amnesia, avoiding light will make monsters less likely to find you, and in Freddy's, using the cameras, lights, and doors keeps out the killer animatronics, but both have a cost. Overusing these tools can make the situation more dire. For Amnesia, staying in the dark too long will drive the player insane, making it near impossible to continue as controls fail to respond. While in Freddy's, if the player uses their power supply for the night, they can no longer take actions to protect themselves as the doors, lights, and cameras all shut off. You're just sitting in there in the dark waiting for something to pop out and eat you. These consequences cause the players to limit their own actions, playing dangerously one way to avoid risk in another. These are soft limitations, where we influence the player's decisions and choices through incentive and disincentive rather than hard limitations, and mixing these in will help us build suspense with our mechanics by making the player choose what danger and fear they want to face. Letting it be their decision is one of the best things you can do. The effective use of these principles in other gaming mediums, like board games and role-playing games, is a bridge to analog gaming that proves the ideas can work in a TCG setting. A big challenge jumping to analog is that digital games have the benefit of code to run enemies, promoting immersion because the player only has to worry about their own actions. In analog games, it's up to the player to run both sides, complicating the game and breaking immersion. Playing the killer makes them a lot less scary because we understand how they work. One of the best examples of an analog game doing this well is Betrayal at the House on the Hill, one we've discussed before on this channel. The game has two phases, the exploration phase, where players move their characters around to build the house and find items, and the haunt phase, caused by an unfortunate die roll result after finding an omen, one of the item types. Here, two sides are created as one player becomes the traitor, and they compete to achieve their goals before the other. The traitor player is usually responsible for running the enemies, acting as the game's code to keep the good players immersed. But what about our techniques though? How effectively does it use them? Aesthetically speaking, the imagery, items, event names, locations, and story all evoke a degree of fear mixed with excitement. Rooms like the chapel and the pentagram chamber expand the lore of the house as players wonder what sinister plots may unfold and omens like girl and mask are simple, but have extra flavor text to foster anxiety and spur the player's imagination. Mechanically, fear of the unknown and limited information play a huge role. Neither the good guys nor the bad guys know everything the other side needs to win. For example, there might be nightmares loose in the house while the traitor is asleep. If some number escape, the players lose, but only the traitor knows the specific amount. The traitor knows the heroes are trying to wake them, but they don't quite know how. Further, the players don't know what tiles will come next as they build the house, nor what cards they'll draw from the item, event, or omen piles. The game also requires some dice rolling to determine outcomes. While there can be modifiers, it's still nerve-wracking, especially once the hunt begins, to make these rolls and hope for the best. These are both instances of random elements, a great fear-inducing technique when done well. By creating situations where the players need to interact with a random element, suspense is built and fear elicited. The outcome could be positive or negative, even disastrous, and everything from placing new rooms to rolling for a fight carries this fear. This technique is more fun for the player when modifiers or slight control is introduced, but leaving it as complete randomness in certain cases can be just as effective. And finally, the game's two halves limit player action effectively through soft limitations. Their priorities shift from discovery to defeating the traitor, and while they can still explore and find items to help them succeed, it may not be the goal anymore. 
especially if there are monsters disincentivizing them from moving to certain areas of the house. Any stat dropping completely to zero will kill them, deterring them from actions which could harm their stats and building tension where it's necessary to endanger them. All in all, Betrayal does a great job eliciting fear from the players. Of course, not every game does this well, and to look at some pitfalls we can avoid, we're circling back around to Call of Cthulhu the card game, which I'll shorten to COC for ease. Aesthetically, the game is on point. It pulls from Lovecraft's vast library of cosmic horrors and uses sinister colors and card art to invoke creepy and horrific fear. After this, however, the game begins to run into trouble. COC's first issue is a lack of unknown and random elements to build dread and terror, a large part of Lovecraft's bread and butter. As we've discussed, trading card games like this use a pre-constructed deck. The players build it from a pool of available cards, so while there is a randomness to the cards drawn in a given game, after one game both players have a rough idea of what's in the opponent's deck and how often they'll see those cards. The majority of cards in the game are placed face up on the table where both players can see them, removing suspense from the equation. As in many TCGs like Magic the Gathering, there are cards that stay in hand and can pop out to interrupt the opponent, but skilled players can get a read on what cards their opponent has based on previous plays and the resources they've reserved, leaving these cards as surprises at best and never really scary. This isn't exclusively a COC problem, but there are other TCGs that do this better. Yu-Gi-Oh's trap cards, for example, make playing against a heavily back row focused strategy terrifying because you see not a resource, but the card itself, the threats right there. It's a tangible threat, but because the specifics are unknown, playing through several set cards becomes a lot more perilous, scary, and suspenseful. The second issue, however, is the biggest reason COC fails to create fear. Its overly complex nature separates players from their emotions. In Mark Rosewater's GDC talk from earlier, he described two primary ways we appeal to our players. So your game can speak to your audience on an intellectual level, or it can speak to them on an emotional level. Now both are valuable, but when you speak to the players on an emotional level, you're more likely to create player satisfaction. So lesson number five, don't confuse interesting with fun. COC does a lot of work within that interesting category. It takes its design inspiration from the human side of the Cthulhu mythos and the main mechanics of the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, focusing on story points and investigation with a supernatural element that unravels as the game goes on. Players win the COC card game by earning three story cards, and to gain a story, the player needs five success tokens. These tokens are earned via effects and by fighting over the story in a four-stage combat round. It's… a lot, and that complexity has a cost. It's stimulating the intellectual part of the brain focused on interesting ideas rather than the primal part of the brain that experiences emotions, like fear. In effect, the game created a logical, Holmesian battle of wits and unraveling of mystery, which is Lovecraft's mythos on the surface. The emotional underpinnings of fear and horror, however, got buried and lost underneath the mechanics. With these examples at our disposal, I think it's time we bring this all together into a design session. First, the obvious. What emotion are we trying to elicit? We want our players to experience fear. Additionally, since this is a game, not a nightmare, we will still want it to be fun and enjoyable. While there will be mechanics that limit player options and agency to instill terror, they still need enough control to find it enjoyable. The two main kinds of fear we'll be using are unknown fear and horrific fear, which we'll expand on in a bit. Next, what techniques do we have at our disposal? The four tools we've seen throughout these examples are aesthetics, limited information, limited action, and random elements. We also want to avoid overcomplicating the game and taking too much control away from our players. Both of these will make the game less fearful and fun. In order to keep our game simple, its win condition is reducing the opponent's life total to zero, which is achieved through combat and effect damage. With aesthetics, we can utilize all four types of fear in card art. Our goal was to have players fighting each other with their fears, so scary creatures and locations will be front and center. Beyond this, however, we'll make the cards themselves unsettling. Card backs, frames, and borders are all great places to do this. These are also design elements in your cards. If you've ever seen Monster House, this is the unnerving horror aesthetic we'll aim for. Strangely overlapping an old, rotting wood which seems conscious. We want the game itself to feel alive, which is a great use of horrific fear. 
It's unnatural. It shouldn't be. But the game is breathing! To add to this aesthetic, the card backs will feature a hole in the wooden boards through which an eye peers out and other unsettling features creeping through the cracks. For limited information, we'll utilize set cards. By creating a card type similar to Yu-Gi-Oh's traps, we can create a tangible sense of danger for our players through foreshadowed threats. We could also use a resource system, similar to the Bakugan TCG, where there aren't any colors and the players just place cards face down from their hand as energy sources, but that might get too confusing with the other face down cards, so we'll table that idea and come back to it later if needed. Limiting player action is our next tool, and this is where we can implement the game's unique mechanic. Remember how aesthetically we're making the game feel alive? What if we apply that mechanically by letting the game itself act as a third player? Our combat system acts similarly to Yu-Gi-Oh's, where players can select their attack targets and creatures that die go to the discard pile. But as in most card games, sometimes you can't kill a creature in battle. It's just too big. If a creature leaves the field by means other than combat, it is placed into a new deck, the game's deck which will now take turns alongside the players. These cards return to their owners at the end of the game. Tentatively, we'll call this the Madness deck. But think of it as the creatures going insane and turning on their owners, preying on horrific fear. The Madness deck will also be our prominent random element. Once this deck is in play, it's shuffled at the start of each turn. At the end of each turn, the top card of the Madness deck is revealed. All creatures will have a madness effect with a keyword and number denoting the type and severity of effect. Immolate 3, for example, would burn each player for 3 life points. These effects apply to both players unless otherwise stated or they use an effect to protect themselves from it. Any cards revealed from the madness deck are shuffled into the deck at the start of the next turn. Through this mechanic, we can introduce an element of chance utilizing fear of the unknown that the players have slight control over. They get to choose what cards go into the Madness deck, and when to put them there. But after, it's out of their hands. This builds suspense and creates fear, as the players never know what's coming next, and that building anticipation followed by a shocking reveal acts like a jump scare. Told you we'd get back to it. The mechanic also creates hard and soft limits for the player's actions. One player can permanently remove a problematic card from their opponent's grasp by putting it into the Madness deck giving the players a way to place hard limits on each other. However, feeding the deck introduces negative effects for both players, disincentivizing them from doing so unless necessary or as a strategic push to end the game, creating a soft limit of what removal options the players are willing to use. All of this is kept simple enough for the players to manage with minimal effort, and the way in which players' action is limited isn't so overbearing that they don't enjoy themselves. And that, my friends, is a rough idea of where this game's design could go. What do you think? While this might not be the design everyone would craft, that's the beauty of game design. When we understand how to tackle a problem, the solutions become a lot more fun and varied to work out. The goal of this video was, beyond designing a cool idea and rough mechanics for a horror TCG, to give you the tools to design a game around a specific emotion. First, build an understanding of that emotion then analyze other games that effectively use it to build a toolkit of techniques. Finally, apply those tools to craft solutions in your own design. This process works for themes, time periods, and more, but emotion should be the starting point for any game. After all, if a game doesn't have a heart, how can you give it life? Thank you so much for watching. You have my humble and eternal Gratitude. What did you think of the conversation? Was this a helpful example of breaking down and mechanically implementing an emotion in game design? Did our hypothetical game incorporate fear well? And of course, does it sound fun and scary to you? Is it something you'd want to play? I'd love to hear your thoughts, so let's keep the discussion rolling down in the comments. If you enjoyed the conversation, subscribe and ding -a that notification bell so you never miss an update. For the foreseeable future, I'll be trying to publish at least one video a month, and that little bell is the best way to make sure you know as soon as a new discussion is available. The world, and America specifically, have been in a really weird place the past half a year. I'm fortunate enough right now to have a job, although it isn't in my field and I get part-time benefits despite working close to 40 hour work weeks because we're low on staff. It's made balancing the channel, career hunting, and managing the rest of my life tricky, to say the least. I haven't been doing a great job of it. 
but I'm putting together a new office space right now, which will hopefully help some of that. I'm a lot more focused here. I'm actually coming to you from there right now. And I'm also done, almost done, setting up my new computer, which should allow me to speed up the editing process. While this has been going on, we've also crept up on 600 subscribers at the time of recording, which is crazy to me. Uh, seriously, from the bottom of my heart, thank you all so much for the support while I've been away. I read all the comments even if I don't have time to answer them, and I forget to like them or heart them, and seeing how much people are enjoying the videos has really kept me going through all of this. Let's push this as far as it can go and try to hit a thousand subs by the end of the year. You can follow the channel on Facebook and Twitter at Draw5Move5. I will do my best to keep up with those platforms from now on to get you guys hyped for new videos and to share other cool game design content because there's not enough of it and every time I find some I should pass it along to you. My name is Gabe, this is Draw5Move5, and until next time, Happy Halloween, and go have a good game.